Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Nathan Janaski, who is a professor of chemistry, material science and engineering, biomedical engineering and pharmacology at Northwestern University. He is associate director of the International Institute for Nanotechnology at Northwestern. His research spans biomedical translational polymeric materials, mimicking biological materials, and advancing basic research in nanotechnology. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you very much for having me. Sure, yeah. So I want to go through your papers um, in more detail. But before you start, um, I would like to lay out a conceptual framework for your research um, details. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just very quickly, Nathan, I was at Pfizer in the 90s, uh, not as a researcher, but as a business guy. And when I was there, I used to think that pharma R&D is very inelegant. Uh, We create these agents. We actually have no idea what they're all going to do once it's inside the body. So we go through many experiments, first in animals and then in humans in various phases to see what actually happens. Mm -hmm. Um, And to assure that too many people are not killed, (laughs) there's a phase one study looking at just toxicity first and then in, uh, in tightly controlled doses there. And then we go back and look at uh, efficacy. Um, so when I left Pfizer in 2000, the attrition rates in what, uh, what is called phase 2 and phase 2B in combination was about 85%, uh, which meant that only about 1 in 100 um, compounds uh, that a pharmaceutical company tries actually succeed through that process of human testing mm-hmm. uh, into market. And if you attrition adjust that the total expenses it's about 1.4 billion per successful compound in the market. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think in 20 years since then, the attrition rates remained pretty much the same. Costs have gone up about 30% more due to inflation and other reasons. And so this process still appears to be somewhat inelegant, <laughs> uh, at least from my perspective. So you, you have a little bit of a different approach to it, right? So, so could you talk a bit about the platform that we, you, you have been working on? Well, yeah, I, I, I think in academia as well, you have to remember, we don't have the uh, burden of um, always taking drugs to market. And, and rather we, you know, take, have, have, have taken and, and, and many others an approach to developing um, exactly that, thinking about new platform technologies that could be eventually translatable. Certainly that's, that is a major goal. And so, but our main concern is in, you know, where can we innovate? And in our case, where can we innovate on the material side, uh, material science, um, you know, polymer chemistry side, where can we make impact, you know, where can we have an impact where maybe in the small molecule drug development world, um, maybe even in, in other kinds of uh, nanoscale or microscale formulations, where, where have they failed because of maybe trying to shoehorn in an old drug into a new formulation, or as you've sort of alluded to, screening large, uh, large numbers of drugs, perhaps some drugs that are already approved, for example, for new uses. Um, yeah. h- how can we sort of start breaking out of that? And I think 
you know, there are many, many parallel efforts from all the way from the biomarker discovery world uh, through to the types of things we're interested in. And so essentially, you know, in the, in the biomedical space, what we've done uh, over the years is look at where I, I think a common thread has been looking at where there are biomarkers that have been identified, uh, certainly by, by many other groups. Um, for example, enzymatic uh, uh, upregulated uh, extracellular enzymes, for example, that are associated with inflammation, which is sort of the basis of one of our technologies. Um, yeah, yeah. And rather than look at it as a target for drugging directly, and so this would be the traditional or, or even make quite innovative methods for looking at how do we go after drugging those enzymes uh, selectively with small molecules or, or even larger molecules, antibodies, proteins, peptides. Um, rather than directly attacking those enzymes, how do we preserve them? They're there, they're part of the inflammation response, and instead use them to target materials. And yeah. in that way, you're not inhibiting the enzyme, you're not getting the off-target effects of that inhibition process, which can be problematic actually in that case, because the enzymes are present elsewhere in the body, but rather use them to target a material, a diagnostic and a therapeutic. And I think that, mm. that's been a common thread between both our cancer work and our work in, um, in uh, myocardial infarction as well. It's kind of leverage biomarkers in, in perhaps a different way. And so, so one innovation here is a transport mechanism, right, Nathan, if I understand it correctly? The, the transport, yes. In cancer, we've been really excited about an opportunity, uh, opportunities around um, uh, hitchhiking on metabolic pathways, again, associated with cancer. And in this case, it is a transport process. And this is from the point of injection of the material, or in this case, of a, of a, of a molecule, um, uh, through to when it uh, is taken into cells and tissues. And so, again, these, these are transport pathways that are, that are necessary for certain tumors uh, to feed themselves. And so they're feeding themselves um, uh, quite vigorously with exogenous, or in other words, um, fats and proteins that come from the outside world, and the outside world being the other parts of our body, so our blood and other, other parts of the organs that they're in. Yeah. Um, and so, again, the question wasn't for us wasn't, well, you know, there'd been a lot of efforts actually to drug those pathways um, and, and in some cases to utilize them in that way to inhibit them, for example. So inhibit sort of the, the process by which cells and tissues, cancer cells and tissues are trying to build the components to build more cells, right, to propagate the mm -hmm. cancer and uh, to, to maintain this high energy metabolism, high metabolism process. Instead of directly drug them, use those channels as transporters of completely orthogonal, completely unrelated anti-cancer drugs to try to get around maybe problems of drug resistance, um, okay. to try to take um, uh, maybe therapeutics that otherwise are somewhat limited in how much you can dose and try yeah. to change the game in, in that way. So that, that's been a big, exciting new push for us. Okay, so, so, so one focus there is um, sort of improving the therapeutic intake, yeah. right? Yep. So the difference between the toxic dose and effective dose. Mm -hmm. And in conventional R&D, we just look at it, you know, sort of the average population uh, where those things are. If you were to go into personalized medicine, mm -hmm. there are a lot of uh, degrees of freedom there, but uh, pharmaceutical companies haven't been uh, really willing to do that mm -hmm. yet. Um, but but I think your efforts uh, in in the transport mechanism that you described, and, and some of the newer technologies in nano uh, materials that you will talk about, uh, is essentially getting to that right. So can we get a a higher uh, toxic dose or a lower effective dose, or essentially broaden yep. that therapeutic index? That's the goal. That's exactly right. And and I think I think that that you know if you if you think of uh, drugs that are very safe, you know, we think of that as having this very large window between where it's effective, and that's defined some, some, some uh, minimally effective uh, um, response, for example, through to where um, you have a tolerated dose, so a patient tolerance for it, or um, um, in our, and obviously in animal studies, the animal's tolerance for the, for the drug. And so the yeah. bigger that window, the, the, the safer, but I think also that the, it's recognized, of course, that the, the bigger that window, the more opportunity potentially you have for getting into sort of a new manifold of activity of the same drug. So if you're dose limited 
if you're si sort of side effect limited in terms of the dose, um, then that caps your ability to go after uh, the disease and in some cases, right? Um, okay. And in, in certain traditional chemotherapeutics, that is the, the wisdom. So, yeah, and I think by, by targeting the drug um, or targeting a material that acts as a drug depot, Th that's well, that's where the game is um, to to try to overcome those barriers. And there there are lots of it, very interesting drugs that have lots of off target effects. Um, mm. And so the whole field of even small molecule drugs, uh, nano uh, scale carriers, uh, you know, there's lots and lots of labs really hammering away at this question of how do we broaden uh, a therapeutic index? How do we open that window? Right. Okay. And so, so if you take an existing agent. Uh, and if you piggyback on some process that you can identify, you can get to the target site mm -hmm. in a much more efficient fashion, mm -hmm. uh, in which case you can broaden the therapeutic index, right? So that, that's, that's piggybacking on some process. Uh, but then also there is nanomaterials, mm -hmm. right, that, that you could utilize in that yeah. Yeah. So in the in the one instance, that'd be the yeah, like you said, the piggybacking on a process of, say, uh, molecule consumption that's inherent to the disease. And what you were saying earlier is right, that it could be uh, personalized in some cases or, or at least in sort of batches of patients, like certain types of tumors at certain times, maybe metastatic disease, for example. So it might not be person by person, but it might be a marker that's narrowed down to a specific uh, uh, class of disease, for example. In yeah. the case of nanomaterials, you know, there's been lots of lots of work in the area, and, and the thought has been along those lines of what features, that there are physical features, so um, uh, some of the, you know, the wisdom around uh, the leakiness of the tissue, the tendency of diseased tissue to be maybe more indiscriminate about taking out nanomaterials. And so there's been a lot of efforts in those, that sort of space. Our yeah. approach has been really, I think the, the what, what's interested us is this idea of being able to retain materials for long periods of time as depots of drugs yeah. and or maybe diagnostics as well in the diseased tissue, but being able to inject a material that's actually very relatively small. And so the, the, the game has been very often played in the following way. You, you make a nanomaterial that is long circulating or a particle or a, some kind of a material that's long circulating. So you get lots and lots of shots on goal, right? You're circulating for long periods of time. And so over time you accumulate in the tumor. Our approach is really lent towards more towards and increasingly recently to materials that can be injected um, would circulate very rapidly and clear. And they might clear through the kidneys, for example, in the optimal case. Um, and instead, what they're doing, so that, in other words, they're below the renal clearance threshold. So your body isn't seeing them as a nanoparticle. It's not um, what, what, what happens often on the nanoscale is particles, materials are uh, seen as foreign entities. You know, they're, they're almost yeah. the same size as viruses. So they're right. consumed by your system, taken to the liver and destroyed. And so you get a lot of, a liver, a lot of liver accumulation instead mm. of targeting other disease, other sites. And so what we've tried to do is say, okay, go way below, go to a low, a, a small object, a, a low molecular weight species that assembles inside the disease tissue into a larger structure so that it can't come back out. And so this is what we did, for example, in the case of a uh, heart attack, where the wound, uh, you know, the injury, I should say, in the, in the heart and the left ventricle uh, is considerable. It is uh, leaky tissue. It's sort of open, open windows. It's kind of like inflamed and open, opened up the doors and windows to the vasculature. So there's a way to get materials in uh, yeah. the vasculature. The trick has been to keep them in there. And in our case, by having them sort of expand, they're kind of expansile materials, expand and get trapped inside. They can't be pumped back out of the heart. We've had mm. success showing that first step, at least, that we're able to keep and accumulate materials. The next challenge for us is, okay, you can do that. Now, can you deliver drugs and get a meaningful uh, therapeutic effect? Uh, can you get a me meaningful efficacy in terms of heart function? And th that's kind of the next step. So the, so the annual model, so just talk a little bit about uh, myocardial infarction uh, related yeah. work that you have done. So in animal models, uh, in, uh, in mouse models, I guess, um, when you have an injury, there is a lot of inflammation 
and you have shown that you can actually get materials to that specific site mm -hmm. and it can have a mechanism for those materials to stay there for a while is that yeah is that what has been accomplished okay. yes so they so yeah, yeah the, the, in, the the process by which you uh, essentially have a, a a blockage that leads to hot the the damage right um yeah. is a process that leads to obviously cell death so this is muscle cell death um and then reperfusion so you're blocking the blood and then the blood's coming back you know maybe after surgery and so the patient's recovering and their heart continues to go through this inflammation process and so this is a process of rebuilding you think of scar formation on your arm if you got a cut right you the same kind of process you rebuild the the uh the matrix that holds the cells together you propagate new skin cells new muscle cells and you try to heal the tissue this is exactly what's happening in the heart um, except the um, the heart muscle is very poor at doing that. And so you end up replacing the muscle with a large scar. And, right. and if the, the, the field has been, in terms of driving towards sort of tissue regeneration, uh, sort of biomaterials approaches or bioengineering approaches, has been trying to grapple with this. And is there stem cell, are there stem cells you could inject? Are there anti-inflammatories? And our efforts have, have really just paralleled that and said, well, let's build a artificial scaffold within that injury um, <clears throat> where you could then release anti-inflammatories. You could release um, um, uh, other components that may aid in the maybe production of new heart tissue. And we've, we've worked on that for several years now with a, a group who's really an expert in that area at UC San Diego, Karen Chrisman, who's in bioengineering there. So her and I have worked on that from these sort of two different angles together to try to address that through exactly that process. Okay. And so, so from my understanding, Nathan, so when you use nanomaterials, let's say nanotubes or something like that, yeah. um, can you encase those things with an agent? Um, you mean, can you, oh, can, can, you, can yeah. you put a drug can, agent inside the materials? Right. Yes. Right. Um, so, so the idea would be then uh, through that you can deliver it uh, to to a target site, and is there any way you can control that externally? Yeah, that's interesting. We we've we've there's a lot of interesting approaches to that, and so we've we've looked at uh, in our own work we've really favored processes that are controlled by the chemistry. So what we do to encapsulate the drug is connect it inside. Um, uh, via a semi-permanent linkage that's degradable in the inside the the organ yeah. but yeah the there, there are some efforts to use um sort of you could target something and then use an external um externally applied stimulus we, we've favored sort of inflammation associated stimuli that are specific to the tissues but you could imagine <clears throat> implanting a material and then addressing it sort of from the outside world and, and people have worked on, you know, this photodynamic therapy in the case of cancer, uh, using um, uh, maybe ultrasound, uh, heating, uh, magnetic fields. You could, you could use, for example, a magnetic quite strong magnetic fields. And so we don't do that kind of work, but there is sort of a rich uh, ongoing um, uh, set, of, set of materials and studies in that area. Okay, okay. You have a paper here um, related to the metal organic nanotubes. Yep. Um, and so, so, so what exactly is a metal organic nanotube and um, what are the uses of that different from the, the typical nanotubes that we think about? Yeah, so this work um, is, is really an interesting direction for us. So we got very interested in um, a, a particular set of questions that were, have come up a lot across all kinds of fields of material science in chemistry um, of, of all kinds of materials. And that is mechanisms by which they form uh, from the initial molecular components um, to give us these um, uh, really large, well, largest strum in their nanoscale, but they're large structures compared to the molecules. Yeah. What is the process by which molecules organize in order to generate micro, nano, micro, and then ultimately macro scale materials that we see in the yeah. world around us? And so these are sort of so-called sort of seed and growth processes. Um, you know, on the nanoscale, you know, once molecules have become materials at that interface, 
there's a lot of difficulty in, in sort of characterizing that process. Now, people care a lot about the materials of this type, um, and we've looked at others very re similarly related called metal organic frameworks. Yeah. Sort of a general class of porous materials that are really fascinating, that have kind of taken the world by storm in terms of lots and lots of interest across multiple fields, where you're looking at storage of gases, so hydrogen gas storage maybe, uh, you're looking at cat yeah. catalytic processes for, say, taking up, C soaking up CO2. Uh, there are programs of people looking at putting these um, at, at room temperature and soaking up water to trap water out of the atmosphere. Just in incredibly interesting uh, materials of this very high surface area materials, that kind of class. And we got interested for our part. We've, we've collaborated with multiple labs. That particular work was with a group at uh, the University of uh, Tennessee, David Jenkins, who's yeah. a pioneer in that area of looking at this sort of one dimensional tubular structure of those kinds of materials. And they're really fascinated in whether or not you could make a single tube that would be like a tunable version of a carbon nanotube. So carbon nanotubes kind of have set geometries and he's, his efforts have been, well, could we, could we blow that away by, or out of the water by looking at tuning these things? So you'd have like a straw type material that you'd have tunable yeah. thickness of the straw instead of being stuck with uh, the kind of chemistry you get maybe specifically from the, the carbon. And so they, and we kind of got together after a seminar he gave uh, actually at the university and I said, look, I think we might be able to directly visualize these forming. And, and you know, we got excited about the possibility that, of course, if you can see it form, if you can understand how it forms, then that informs um, how you synthesize it, how you make it, right? And this is just classic grassroots way of thinking about um, designing syntheses is if I understand the mechanism, then I have a way of per perturbing it. And that's exactly what we started doing in that study, which was to essentially video these nanotubes forming, and it is videography, mm. but using an electron microscope. And, and that's where sort of our lab has interfaced with others on the more sort of fundamental synthesis and then ultimately applications and material science side has been in the characterization of those types of systems uh, by visualizing them in liquids as they're dynamically moving by electron microscopy. Mm. So these are still in the nano yeah. scale. So do you see um, more interesting applications of it in, in the therapeutic area? Just, 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 just like the MI application? Yeah, that, you that's a, that would be, we've, we haven't thought about that. So we haven't thought of them as, as, as being, you know, immediately applicable in, in therapeutics, but they, we, we have, and, and they've considered them and other adsorbent materials as well, like metal organic frameworks of this kind of class are being looked at for exactly that uh, purpose in some cases. They can encapsulate proteins, for example, um, which is some really awesome work coming out of some colleagues of mine at Northwestern and others, um, where you know you can imagine stabilizing a therapeutic, for example, in these large pores that these materials have. And as I mentioned, this sort of nano straw idea would be like what we call in, in the lingo a host-guest type interaction, where the tube is a host and it holds a chemical guest inside that can then ultimately have like a time release or a programmed release. Um, that, that hasn't been investigated specifically for those structures, but it is, it is a field of increasing interest for sure. Yeah, yeah, excellent. We'll take a quick break, uh, Nathan, and when we come back, we'll talk about your work in the cancer. Okay, area. thank you. Okay, thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we are back. Um, so, so you have another paper here, Nathan, uh, and this is about uh, sort of the piggyback uh, process that we talked about uh, before, and this is in cancer. Mm -hmm. So this is Taxol, right? Yeah, yeah. Along with the human serum albumin. That's correct. And so you're, you're finding a way to get to the, get to the cancer? Yes. Yes. So, so the, this, this effort came about as a result of... Um, Sort of us looking at again that that idea that um, could we could we take some of these you know known biomarkers which you know, upregulated you know the cells are kind of putting out signals in order to consume something so 
This is known, for example, in a, a variety of different um, uh, cancers for uh, hormones being involved or some receptor uh, for, for some other kind of energy consuming purpose that might be present on normal tissues, but more prevalent on tumors because of their sort of desire to grow faster, et cetera. Yeah. And so in this case, there's a receptor associated with um, uh, many tumor types um, during the process of sort of upregulated um, uh, consumption of fats um, mm. that sits on their cell surface. Uh, there are other receptors throughout the tissues that uh, regulate and, and, and consume uh, proteins as well. And so what we looked at in this case was uh, how do we hitchhike on that? Literally, what, what's, it was sort of a Trojan horse strategy, right? How do we trick the cancer into taking up uh, a molecule that is actually a, a toxin for, well, it's a cytotoxin. It will kill all kinds of cells. Um, it particularly affects cancer cells, and it's very commonly used, as you said, Taxol, or uh, by its other name, Paclitaxel. Yeah. The approach can be generalizable. So again, we've sort of favored the development of these types of platforms. And so it could be put, it could be used as a, you know, imagine the Trojan horse can carry Greek soldiers. It can carry a lot of other things too, <laughs> right? And, mm. and so the concept, obviously maybe, you know, there's a time and a place for it. Once you've seen it once, you're not going to get tricked again. Uh, but the tumors do, right? They, they are kind of stuck on a path like all right. of us, right? We need to eat and they can rewire and they can become uh, uh, resistant to certain uh um, drugs and and some of these are indeed resistant to taxanes, which is this class mm. of drug. Um, people have tried to get around that in a number of different ways, and so one of them is to increase the dose. And there's a lot of toxicity associated with these drugs. So that we were talking earlier about therapeutic index, right. these class of drugs work really well. There's lots of others, cisplatin, for example, another cancer drug. They they have narrow therapeutic indices. They have mm. narrow windows. So broadening those has been a big area of research. And so we sort of thought, well, we'll take that sort of proof of concept drug. Um, if we can prove it for that, it, it's immediately portable to other kinds of drugs and, and it works. And so the, the idea is, of course, that um, well, what do we do differently, I guess? And, and what we did was we took the uh, existing drug, paclitaxel, yeah. and we connected it to a new kind of fat uh, that's a synthetic fat that has two ends to it. One, you can connect to the drug. The other end looks exactly like the native fat. And in, in specifically, it looks like stearic acid, which is a 18 carbon long chain that is known and natural. Um, it binds to, as you said, human serum albumin, but that's just one part of the story. It also binds the transporters on the cell surfaces that transport in fats, fatty acid transporters. Right. And so you've sort of engaged in, without directly drugging, you've engaged in the entire pathway in that way. And, mm. and we think, you know, we're, 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 we've, um, we're really excited to try to further this along. And I mean, our lab is a you know, basic science lab. We've, we've, um, we've got lots more understanding since that paper came out of mechanism of uptake, uh, scope in terms of different drugs. Uh, moving away from paclitaxel to biological molecules, for example, and a whole range of things. Um, but we've, we've also started a company to go and try to pursue that because it, it really needs to be done at a large scale and in a translational way. And, and, and so that, that's hopefully where that's going. But yeah, that was the, the basic science question of, could you even use that kind of new kind of lipid to trick the uh, system? And it, it turns out you can. So we're pretty excited about it. Yeah, so so the trick there is the design of the synthetic, I guess, right? So if you if you have the synthetic um, sort of piggybacking on the HSA, if it has been, uh, it, it has to be there has to be some advantage that it is taken up only by the cancer cell, right? Uh, to, for us to extract an advantage, uh, and, and so yeah. So is it is it really the design of the synthetic uh, where the trick is going to be? Well, it 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 needs to be biased towards the cancer tissue. So the drug yeah. the drug right now, as given, you know, it potentially can go to all kinds of cells, and that's where you get the off-target problems and and yeah. this tolerated dose. So you could the perfect targeting system, let's just say, doesn't exist today. I could say maybe it never will, but you never want to say never. Yeah. You know, the perfect targeting system, you would take the most toxic drug you could possibly find. This is sort of the, the field of antibody drug conjugates. 
picking a really specific interaction between the cell surface maybe and 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 a targeting group like an antibody and then guiding at very maybe low dose the most toxic thing you can possibly make hmm. and and that's not really this game this is this is much more uh, I, I think uh, about um uh, biasing a drug that already functions at, mm. at maybe a, a broad range, a broad enough range that you can even increase it even further and get access to this whole new um, level of activity. And of course, we're in mice, so lots can go wrong. Um, <laughs> right. But that that's the idea. And so, yes, it's all cold, controlled at the level of synthesis. There's no there's no weird uh, uh, trick. There's no uh, we don't have any kind of unusual stimulus it's not a nanomaterial it's it's good old-fashioned synthetic uh, small molecule chemistry and really looking at uh, ligand design so how do you design a molecule to look more and more like what the what the natural system is expecting to see hmm. and and this has been the sort of med chem game right how do i mimic a mimic a natural hormone or a natural ligand of a protein in order to trick it into binding to my drug and and in this case we use that game but instead to carry and transport a, a molecule throughout the bloodstream. And, and it shows good results in the mouse model? Yeah, in several mouse models. It worked, yeah. worked very, very well, um, including some, some other unpublished work uh, that's ongoing. Um, we consistently see this effect of, you know, you know, almost a 20 times increase in, in therapeutic index. I think it might have been 16 or 17, if you quote me on it. Um, mm -hmm. But then in, the, in, the, in a particular version of, of, of the studies, and again, I mean, the, the caveats here, these are xenographed animal models. Um, they're right. sort of an initial first step for sure. Um, and as I said, I mean, I think, you know, ultimately this needs to be taken on and the proof will be in the pudding if you can ever get it to a human trial, but certainly very, very exciting in terms of where it could go. And I, I think actually the, the underlying thing is perhaps exciting for paclitaxel, uh, but more broadly, you know, exciting for what it might be able to do for other drugs that aren't soluble that don't target at all, that have problems of off-target effects, but would otherwise be these fantastically promising drugs. And so we're very interested in working with other labs, other groups, new drugs, um, invigorating old drugs with, with a fairly simple translational uh, uh, sort of technology. So xenografted, um, meaning Nathan, um, yeah. would be using actually human yeah. tumors into into mouse? Yeah, sorry for the lingo on that. Yeah, Xeno yeah. being foreign, so it's a foreign graft of any kind. Uh, but in this specific case, yes, a human tumor um, in a mouse uh, model. So the mouse's immune system is compromised so that it will grow a human tumor. Okay. The other, okay. The other type, by contrast, is a mouse that, that either spontaneously gets cancer or a mouse model that is used as a mouse tumor tissue and that, mm. that would be like an immune intact animal which is a slightly more advanced model okay okay and so if you are successful um you will see sort of the lower toxicity lower systemic toxicity uh but essentially there's sort of the same level of efficacy as as the agent currently provides yeah you in our case and yeah you're absolutely right that that would be great so if you could just decrease the toxicity we get the same effect you would, you would, you'd be okay. What we actually get is an, a much better effect because mm. we can go to much higher doses because it's so much safer. We can go to high doses, but we don't, the, the key here was, and we've done this before and, and actually failed with some nanoparticles we've made where we increase the safety on the high end, but mm. we also increase the amount of drug you needed to deliver, right? That's not, that's okay, but it's not really that exciting, right? Because now you're just <laughs> dosing a lot of drug. Right. You've just moved the goalpost, but it's sort of the same game. This has been, this is a different story. This is where the drug works just as well at the low end, the low dose, mm. but we get a whole new level of activity at very, very high doses. And so because of the safety, which comes from targeting um, and from some other factors, um, we're able to, to, to get to sort of a new kind of activity of the same drug. So it's, I, I mean, I, I, I like it. It's my baby, so I'm going to say something nice about it. But that's kind of where you want to be, right? You want to be in that a real wider window, not just a window that's moved to a higher dose. Yeah, so uh, is there some personalized medicine uh, possibilities here, Nathan? Could you actually titrate 
yeah. uh, to, to get to the optimum effect? Yeah, it's a really good question. We've been talking about this recently because there's there have been some really advances in understanding how these uh, transport, the fat transport systems are upregulated or downregulated or changed depending on specific patients' genetics. So depending on the type of tumor they have, and then a subclass of those tumors where, for example, they have a propensity to become resistant. So there's, yeah. there's different types of, and some of these pathways are known, some of them are more recently being described. And so, I'm not, you know, we're never sure about, you know, if you're talking about individual patient by patient, but certainly I think narrowing in on uh, patient populations where um, the people have been refractory so that they're not responding to a, a, a common, um, commonly given chemotherapeutic or other kind of drug, um, or where, you know, the tumors have become, you know, they've become resistant or that, or a, a subclass of tumors. Um, you're still, you're still talking about, you know, th these are lots and lots of people, so it's not individual <laughs> patients, but I think being able to say, you know, yes, you've tested positive for this, um, this marker on your tumor and therefore this drug, uh, can do something for you that other drugs can't, I think is, I fi find a compelling and powerful thing for us to be involved in because obviously it helps those people who otherwise can't be helped. Right, right. It's exciting. I want to jump into another paper in totally different area. So this is about selenomelanin. Yeah. And, um, and this is a very recent news, uh, I guess, right? So yeah. uh, you're finding some uh, radiation protection for selenomelanin, is that the idea? Yeah, this is a really, really interesting, exciting, fun project for us. Once again, it's our baby, so we love it, you know. And but we, <laughs> yeah. we yeah, we got interested several years ago in in melanin, and you know, melanin's this what we call a you know, we sort of like to say it's this ubiquitous, enigmatic uh, uh, material, and it's it's in almost every well, certainly in every type of organism on Earth, some form of <clears throat> melanin has been found. Um, it's typically associated as being this black pigment or dark brown pigment um, associated with our hair color. Uh, we find it in human skin. It's found in the brain of humans, um, back of the eye, for example, um, in all, all kinds of locations. And there are organisms that use it as uh, pigmentation uh, for a variety of different purposes. Birds, for example, use it in structural coloration. So these beautiful iridescent mm. color you see in peacocks <laughs> is, yeah. is black particle based. It's a pure... It's like a, an optical effect of arranging black particles in space. Lots of birds do that. They're shiny, even the corvids. So that black color you see in crows obviously is generated by them. And if you notice, mm. they've got like a shimmery bluish type of effect if you look at their feathers. So we got yeah, fascinated yeah. in all these aspects of melanin. Um, uh, one of the most, I guess, interesting areas for, for folks in the area is that yes, they are, they can prevent uh, damage from say radializing uh, radiation. So uh, for example, um, and, and and UV, for example, in the case of humans. And so you imagine, you know, your skin becomes darker as you get, uh, uh, as you have sort of this impinging UV light, which people call tanning. Uh, that process is your body <laughs> reacting to uh, the outside world, um, insulting it with UV radiation. And um, right. so that the, what happens is that uh, uh, keratinocytes in your skin get sort of the nuclei get coated in this black pigment. The pigment mm. may be absorbing some light, but what it's really doing best is absorbing radicals that are produced inside the cell. So it's a, it's a radical scavenger. So sort of a defensive it's mechanism. A defensive mechanism, exactly. Yeah. And obviously evolutionarily, um, as well as, um, as, well as you know, in, in humans, in, in, in the case of protecting us from UV, um, but also used in other kinds of color display by different animals that also has some thermal properties and it's a very interesting material. But yeah, so we got broadly interested in it. One of the areas that it, it's shown up a bit is in, um, for example, not just UV protection, but potentially in protecting certain organisms from gamma radiation, so higher energy radiation. And this has led some researchers um, uh, to look at, for example, can it protect patients during um, uh, radiation therapy? Uh, and that's some work from, from uh, several years ago uh, from another group. Um, and so we got interested in these questions of, you know, UV, higher energy radiation, optimizing materials like this for those applications. And this sort of fascinating question of whether or not um, different forms of melanin that exist in nature you know, what, to what degree do they protect to different amounts? 
um, depending if they're one of these other subclasses of melanin. And so looking at it, we sort of looked at one of the structures, which is known as Fayer melanin, which is a sulfur containing melanin. And we thought, well, let's, let's do what chemists do best and sort of move around the periodic table. And so we moved, <laughs> we moved down the periodic table to selenium with the idea that you would get better attenuation or better absorption of x-rays. Um, <laughs> And, and ultimately, uh, potentially more uh, radical content into the material as well. Um, we sort of, during the development of that, we also noticed that we make a very, very close replica structurally, at least as far as we can tell, of natural fair melanin, which is the melanin that gives people, that's present in people's hair when they have red hair, for example. Um, <laughs> so that, that sort of led to this selenium material that we call selenium melanin, are really standing out as this really good x-ray protector. We did that in cells, in human skin cells. Um, and ultimately, yeah, we, we're excited by a couple of things. One is obviously the applications, which I'm happy to talk about. Uh, the second one is this kind of, what well, we kind of find an interesting uh, thought process now that, well, maybe nature already made this. You know, we made it in a lab from chemicals, but, you know, selenium, the, the compounds we used exist in nature. So the precursors right. we use are found in nature. So it's possible that selenium based melanin like this does already exist, which is kind of cool. And, and maybe it's used <laughs> evolutionarily to protect those animals from some process, or maybe it's used as a, a depot for selenium. Um, and so, so that's under investigation. Yeah. Mm. And so, so you mentioned X-rays. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, gamma rays, it hasn't been tested or you find it may not be protected. We haven't done um, a serious test of these materials for gamma uh, yeah. radiation protection. Uh, we did x-rays uh, because we have the source. Um, UV as well um, is sort of underway, but that's, that's not really expected to be that beneficial. The um, okay. gamma uh, brings up the other question and where we think there's some interesting applications potentially in not just protecting organisms like humans, or maybe our skin as an application or something for space travel where, right. um, but the other one is materials. And so, you know, could it be a lightweight coating, for example? And we've, we've just sort of begun these discussions and I'd, I'd love to have more. And we're going to circle back with folks who are really experts in uh, what it would take in terms of a, uh, a shield on spacecraft or maybe even high altitude flight. Um, and so th those things are obviously beyond our expertise, but, happy to collaborate I'm always looking for those phone calls around papers like this but yeah <laughs> we, we, we are fascinated by this idea that you know that nature may be very well have beat us to the punch and already be doing this you know yeah yeah a lot of people want to go to mars uh, nathan yes and, uh, right increasingly right <laughs> some people wanting to go back to the moon mars so. and the moon and and you know yeah. maybe you don't want to line everything with lead right maybe you want some the other <laughs> cool thing about biomaterials like this yeah. is you can produce, you can coax organisms into making them. So we, we, we had a bacteria, we worked with the Navy research lab uh, group that coaxed bacteria into accepting selenium and made a selenium melanin inside bacteria. So you can imagine you could take some bacteria that you just have to feed nutrients and then they make the material for you. So yeah, colonizing other planets, maybe you start thinking, well, maybe if I could get a limited number of organisms to make a lot of different types of materials, then I have a lightweight yeah. way of, of building structures and things like that. And that, that's quite a provocative and I think increasingly interesting thought for people. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. So, you know, one of the thought processes I think is that you have to seed, uh, if you were to go to Mars, you have to seed that with, with organisms mm -hmm. uh, that would make something, but they're also equally vulnerable to all the radiation. Yeah. And so if you can create a species of organisms that are able to create something um, uh, from a food environmental change perspective, right. but also are resistant, yep. uh, then, you know, a lot of the requirements of uh, creating an enclosure uh, goes yeah, away, right? Potentially, so I think it's, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting yeah. thought. And, and you know, the, these um, uh, organisms in the melanin, mel melanized organism class, particularly this we also work with this other kind of melanin called alamelanin, uh, which is a type that's made by fungi. Some of these fungi have been found on the uh, International Space Station uh, around the Chernobyl uh, power station site. And, and they're believed to be, yeah, intrinsically resistant to at least low levels of radiation like that. And even the presence mm -hmm. of 
uh, uh, radioactive uh, materials as well. So uh, within their own, or so yeah, the the sort of organisms on Earth that resist radiation damage or high temperatures, these are all and have sort of long been sought after for how do they do it? Can we port some of those genetic qualities over to other organisms? Um, you know, with it, for example, the, one of the most famous of these kind of ideas was around, you know, using enzymes that propagate DNA from um, a really robust organism so you can do high temperature DNA synthesis. And so mm. this concept of so-called extremophiles, right, organisms that sort of love and flourish under extreme conditions are interesting. Right. And I think if you start thinking about space travel or maybe living on Mount Everest or wherever it is that you think <laughs> is the most extreme environment you want to be in. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so so in conclusion, Nathan, I know that you are doing a lot of research in this area at the cross-section of materials and life sciences. Yeah. Um, so, so you look forward five years. Um, what are the things that you're most excited about? And if you have any predictions where we're going to be more successful, uh, which areas uh, would they be? Yeah, so so we talked about a few few areas of our work and we've got um, some other sort of along the same themes, you know, one area that's really exciting for us on the on the drug delivery, the broad question of drug delivery is, um, you know, whether we and, and certainly people in the field and others, and it'd be exciting to see everybody kind of progress towards being able to uh, drug um, uh, different types of disease associated interactions that have so far eluded small molecules. And you kind of touched on that at the beginning of this process of small molecule drug development. There's so-called sort of undruggable targets. And I think some of the innovations that we're now looking at in terms of hitchhiking on transporters, uh, getting inside cells, uh, you know, tricking tissues maybe into consuming, um, otherwise difficult to get, uh, dr difficult drugs to get inside cells and tissues. If we can crack that, you're talking, and it's almost, you know, that is the challenge, cracking that barrier, getting across these biological barriers. Um, with some of these uh, potentially powerful therapeutics will be game changing. I mean, you're talking about an, a huge impact on answering chem basic chemical biology questions about whether or not you even want to drug those targets through to uh, hitting really known interactions that drive neurodegeneration, they drive cancer, they drive the big unsolved diseases. And you, you, you're talking cancer, heart disease, um, you know, tissue regeneration potentially, certainly neuroregeneration in the concept of uh, in the context of diseases like parkinson's uh, als huntington's and these are the great incurable diseases driven by undruggable uh, interactions and i you know we've got a big push towards it many many other people do and i think next five ten years um it would be exciting to have that breakthrough and i think we'd, you'd start seeing a big difference within the next decade uh, in human health yeah, it's really exciting. So, you know, the conventional process, as you know, is, you know, you test compounds and we think about delivery mechanisms much later in the process. Uh, but what you're suggesting is that go back into discovery and preclinical and have that transport mechanism integral yeah. uh, to, the dr to the drug discovery process. Uh, it's not an afterthought you know, uh, how you deliver the, the agent, but rather it becomes integral to the discovery process, which can substantially change uh, how R&D is done today. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think that's always been built in. I think small molecule, you know, folks have been, it's been built into the drug design, right? Around rules, around what can be done and what can't be done in order for a drug to be like a drug. But I think yeah. as, the, as the, the material science understanding of how to maybe organize those molecules in a different way progresses, then those two sort of ways of thinking can work more hand in hand. And, and so I, I, I do think there's an emerging opportunity in sort of the meeting of sort of biomaterials, material scientists, maybe polymer science um, with uh, some of these uh, just uh, brilliant folks on the, on the small molecule side to do exactly what you're saying. And you know, people have been saying this for some time. It's that that challenge, that idea, is is one that's definitely um, on people's minds, especially as you start looking at these really difficult to drug, difficult to target diseases. And I think the technology and our knowledge really of these biomarkers has got to the point where 
I think we are on the cusp of that, on the verge of it, and certainly able to ask the question and, and, and move forward with it. Right, right. Yeah, excellent. This has been great, Nathan. Thanks so much for spending time. Thank with you me. very much for your interest. Yeah. And I, 